and I am now going to read our um, scripture for the day. And I'm reading from Acts 2, 1 to 22. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak to each other in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there was staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native tongue? Parthians, Medes, and Elamanites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cap Cappadocia, Pontius, and Asia, Phyria, and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya and Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Ju Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Peter, then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to Doug. All right. Rowan, can you do me a favor, please? Can you just run to my my desk in the office and grab my Bible real quick? Thank you. So today is the 23rd of May. And that means some of you will have tomorrow off as it's a holiday. Uh, tomorrow's Victoria Day officially, but unofficially, this is the weekend, uh, the first weekend of summer. It's the beginning of barbecue season or boating season or whatever you want to call it. We all know that according to the calendar, summer begins next month. But this is the first real long weekend of the summer. Is, is that still going or should I stop? Or Okay. And I'm kind of excited about tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow will be my first Victoria Day that I've had off in, in over 10 years. Can I get a little less volume? Thank you. Yeah, tomorrow will be uh, perfect. Yeah, tomorrow will be the, the, the first Victoria Day I've, I've had off in over, in over 10 years, closer to 12 years. Now, now years ago, May, May 2-4 weekend, meant getting together with friends and going on a long motorcycle ride and probably finding a place to camp. But that all changed a few years ago when one of the guys that I, I ride with, he decided that that was the perfect weekend to get married. Well, guess what? He wasn't allowed to ride with us much after that for that weekend. I'm not really sure why. Wives can be really weird about anniversaries. I, I don't really get it. And, I, and I, it didn't really help when I tried to explain to her that, that our tradition predated their relationship. Then it just seemed to make things worse. But anyways, w women are weird, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. But holidays are a good thing, and, and they are a biblical thing. As we read through the Bible, we see several holy days that are sanctified by God. Days set apart as special days that are meant to remind the people of God of the power and works of God. Now, we don't celebrate 
we don't celebrate the Old Testament festivals. But we have our own holidays in the church, right? Christmas is a day set apart to remember and celebrate the birth of Jesus. Thanksgiving is a day set aside to be thankful for all that God has done in the past year. Easter is a day set apart to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And today is a real holiday in the church as well, because today is Pentecost Sunday. And, and this is a, a special day in the life of the church. Pentecost actually happens to be one of those Old Testament festival days. I don't know how many people in the church realize that. But it was the completion of the festival of weeks. So in some ways, it, it is one of the few holidays that is celebrated by both Orthodox Jewish people and Protestant Christians today, although for very different reasons. Today we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. You see, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon someone and they would give a word of prophecy or God would use them to accomplish some miraculous feat and then the Holy Spirit would leave them. And then the first four books of the New Testament, the books that we call the Gospel, that, that took place during the life of Jesus, we see the Holy Spirit. He comes on Jesus at his baptism. But God speaks directly through Jesus because Jesus is God. It is at Pentecost where for the first time the Holy Spirit of God came to dwell in and among the believers of Jesus. At Pentecost, the way that God interacted with his people radically changed. After Pentecost, the people of God had the Spirit of God inside them. If you're a child of God, the Holy Spirit of God is active and alive within you. Now isn't that exciting? Isn't that worth celebrating? Isn't that a bigger deal than the beginning of barbecue season? Today is a holy day set apart to celebrate the fact that the Holy Spirit lives within all believers. Now what does Pentecost even mean? It's a Greek word. All, all it really means is 50. And it's reference to the 50th day, the day of completion of the seven-week festival of weeks. A festival that was given to the people of God by God through Moses. I mean, that's the reason why there were all those people in Jerusalem when we read Acts. Heidi read to us from Acts this morning and we read that there was people from all over the known world in Jerusalem. People that spoke many different languages. It was because they were there to celebrate the festival of weeks. The 50th day after the 49 days of seven weeks. Pentecost was already a holy day. And the disciples were gathered to celebrate this holy festival. But something was different. Because for the first time, the disciples were not required to make sacrifices of goats or lambs or grain. For the first time, the disciples didn't have to make these sacrifices because Jesus was the only sacrifice necessary. And Jesus has paid for your sin at the cross. The disciples were gathered to celebrate Pentecost. They were taking part in this holy festival. It was a time of prayer. It was a time of celebration. It was a time of feasting. It would have been something similar, I would imagine, to what we do on, on Thanksgiving. It's all about grain and the grain harvest. It's all about first fruits. The first day of the 50, when the festival begins, it begins with a barley harvest and a wave offering of sheaves of barley. And the last day that they celebrate the wheat harvest. And this is celebrated with several sacrifices including a wave offering of a loaf of wheat bread containing yeast. And that's really neat, because at all the other holy days, you weren't allowed to eat yeast. At Pentecost, it was all about unleavened bread, but here you ate leavened bread. 
and nobody was allowed to eat any wheat until the priest had completed the wave offering. And the wave offering is when you take something and you wave it north and south and east and west, showing that God is the God of the entire earth. And then you wave it up and down to show that God is the God of heaven and earth and the grave below. And the festivals of, of weeks, or Pentecost, as it was known at that time, because most Jewish people were speaking Greek at that time, was a time of putting away the old and celebrating the new. New life, new yeast, new harvest. Unlike Passover, where they ate unleavened bread at Pentecost, they ate leavened bread. Because it was made from new yeast. They had gotten rid of the old and they were starting fresh. It was a, a time of starting over again. I guess kind of like New Year's. The, the, the entire festival was about celebrating newness. And it's at this festival of newness with Jewish people from all over the known world that God does something totally new. He changes the way he interacts with his people. You see, right before Jesus ascended to heaven, he told his disciples to wait for a comforter. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit of God descends onto the disciples of Jesus and transforms these formerly scared men into powerful apostles. They go from waiting for Jesus to actively proclaiming the good news that all people can be saved, not by works, not by sacrifice, not by keeping festival days or by keeping the law, but by faith in Jesus and by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. The old way is gone, the unleavened bread is gone, and we have a, a new wheat, a new harvest, a new creation with God. No more laws from Pentecost on. From Pentecost on, salvation is received through faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone, and is available to all people. You can be made holy by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. When you surrender your life to Jesus, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. You are filled. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit of God this morning? This morning we're going we're gonna to work through Acts chapter 2. Let me just see if I can find it here. Yep. And if you want to open your Bible and follow along, open it up to Acts chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 1. We're going, to, we're going to go through the first 21 verses. But before we do this, we need to look at the context. We need to understand why the disciples were all still together in Jer Jerusalem. Why they had not gone back to Galilee. Or spread out to tell people about Jesus. And the reason for this is found in Acts chapter 1, verse 4. On one occasion while they were eating with well, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he is Jesus. He gave them this command Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, for which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The disciples had been waiting in Jerusalem since Jesus had ascended to heaven. And they were waiting for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, and we don't know how long it took, but it took a few days. We know it was definitely less than seven weeks because Jew, Jesus was uh, crucified during Passover week. And Pentecost is only seven weeks later. And, and Jesus had spent a few weeks between his resurrection and his ascension, doing things like forgiving and restoring Peter, showing himself and his wounds to, to Thomas, talking to the disciples along the road, eating meals with his disciples. We know they were waiting in Jerusalem for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they were probably expecting to Jesus to return at any day. Are you waiting on Jesus this morning? Because Jesus could return any day. And I think we forget about that. I, I, I think we, 
we take for granted the fact that Jesus could come today. We get complacent. We say, well, Jesus has been coming today for like 2,000 years. And that's true. But if you read through your Bible, it's not uncommon to have these, these long lapses of time. I mean, there's 600 years between God making a covenant with Abraham and Abraham's descendants first entering the land of promise. There's 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. For 400 years, God didn't speak at all to anybody. God is not slow. He's patient. And the disciples were patiently waiting in Jerusalem because they had been told to wait by Jesus. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. It's important to realize that the disciples were not the only ones who heard the wind or saw the fire. The baptism of the Holy Spirit seems to have been witnessed by people outside of the room as well as it drew a crowd. Verse 5, Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontius. And someplace else. And Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and all the parts of Libya near Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We all hear them declaring the wonders of the Lord in our own tongue. And the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples in a way that could be seen and heard and felt. The Holy Spirit came on the disciples with power and allowed them to miraculously speak in languages that they did not know or understand. And I can already hear you asking, if the Holy Spirit is active in every believer today, then why can't we all speak in tongues? Why are we not seeing fire and hearing wind every time somebody commits their life to serving Jesus? And, that, and that's a great question. And I can honestly say that, that I don't know. I don't know why God does the things he does or the way he does them. You see, God is God, and, and, and I'm not. I'm a humble servant. But there are a couple of things that are different now than they were in the first century. First of all, this was the first time that God sent his Holy Spirit to dwell in believers. And we see when God does something new, he usually does something special when that happens. You know, when, when Moses led the people out of Egypt, he parted the Red Sea. And, and when, when uh, hmm, I've lost my Joshua, took over. I couldn't, couldn't remember that name. Uh, when Joshua took over for Moses, he, he, he parted the, the Jordan. God does big things when he changes the way he interacts with people. Fun fact. Something you can impress your friends with. Uh, in, uh, in Hebrew, Joshua and Jesus are the same name. It, it's, all, it's all the same word. So you could interchange them. We could, we could pray to Joshua as easily as we could pray to Jesus because... It's the same word. But anyways, just something. A little trivia if you're on Jeopardy. Anyway. <laughs> anyways, well, why, why, don't we, why don't we see it? Because cause this is the first time, so God's doing something special. This represents a new change in the way that God interacts with his people. And it's a big deal. And to show that it was a big deal. God did something special in a special way. And as we read through the, through the book of Acts, this happens, happens a few times. But there are thousands of people coming to Jesus as we read through Acts. 
And when we read through the New Testament, we see people speaking in, in, in tongues is a common part of worship in many churches. And you know what? It still is today. And, and if the Holy Spirit were to come on Bob and inspire him to, to, to speak in tongues and to come on Nancy and inspire her to interpret what Bob was trying to tell us, then I would praise Jesus. But if that never happens, I still praise Jesus. And all we know is that it happened at Pentecost. And what, it also happened the first time that Gentiles committed their lives to Jesus. And these were significant events and, and, and history-changing events in the church. And both times it was a visible and audible event to demonstrate the change in the way that God interacts with his people. First to the disciples showing a change from the temple system to Jesus as the great high priest in the way to God. And later to the Gentiles demonstrating that Jesus died not only for the Jewish Christians, but for all and everyone who calls on Jesus can be born again. The second possible reason that, that we don't see tongues all the time is we already have the Bible in English. And pretty well every other tongue out there. I, I don't know, like, like if you read through, through, uh, through your Old Testament, you'll see that when the people of Israel entered the promised land, the day they ate from the fruit of the land, God stopped providing manna. When God gives you the ability to feed yourself, he stops doing it for you. Perhaps uh, the gift of tongues is less necessary than it was at that time because the Bible is available to us in both in, in print and and electronically. And we have this fantastic tool called Google Translates. So last week I was watching this YouTube video and, and it was about uh, orchard tools. And one of these tools was this tool that you tow behind a tractor and it picks up apples for you so you don't have to bend down and do it. It looked really cool. And so there was a link in the description below so I, I clicked on the website to find out what one of these, we, these things would cost. And I go to the website, and the website's in Austria, and the website is in, I'm guessing, German. I don't know. I don't know what they speak in Austria. I think they speak German. But I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't sure. But I do know that Heidi speaks Afrikaans, and there are a few words that are similar to German, although closer to Dutch. So I took her to my phone, and I asked her if she could tell me what it said. And then she called me some nasty name, and she pushed a button on the phone, and the website was immediately translated into English. <laughs> so she told me what it said. She just pushed the button. Uh, and tools like this make speaking in tongues a whole lot less necessary. I'm not going to say that the, the gift no longer exists. I know Christians that I respect and trust that have experienced this gift. I know at least one that has experienced this on a mission trip while sharing the gospel with a non-English speaker. The Holy Spirit spoke through this pastor to share the gospel, and this other person heard it in his native language. And I refuse to limit the power of the Holy Spirit. I refuse to say that God does not do something, because God can do whatever he wants. God is sovereign. Now, perhaps the biggest reason we don't see the Holy Spirit at work in Miraculous today is because we don't recognize it. We don't recognize when the Holy Spirit's at work. How often do you recognize the Holy Spirit at work in your life? You know, when you sin and you're, you're feeling, I, I should not have done that or said that or dwelled on that thought, do you recognize the Holy Spirit convicting you and telling you to repent? Pray for forgiveness and then go to wherever it was that you upset and make it right. So you can experience and share the love of God with whoever you may have offended. When you're doing some mindless activity, cutting grass, listening to music, whatever it is, and a name comes into your head, somebody you haven't spe seen or, or spoke to in a long time, do you recognize the Holy Spirit at work and take a moment to pray for that person? And when you pray, how do you pray? A few months ago, we talked about the prayer of the boy Samuel. 
Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. How often do we pray that prayer? Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And then listen to the Holy Spirit. And recognize his work in your life and your prayer life. When you read your Bible, do you pray for wisdom and guidance of the Holy Spirit as you read? When somebody comes to you with a question about love or forgiveness or the Bible, do you recognize the Holy Spirit at work in sending that person to you so that you have an opportunity to share the love of Jesus with them? When you're scared and you don't know what to do and a feeling of peace comes over you, do you recognize the power of the Holy Spirit in this moment? When someone asks you about Jesus, and you have an answer that you are even surprised to hear come out of your mouth. Do you recognize the Holy Spirit at work? One of the biggest reasons we don't see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit on believers today is not that it isn't happening. It's because many of us do not recognize the work of the Holy Spirit right in front of us. Many of us respond like the people who said that the apostles were drunk. The Spirit of God is, is at work right in front of our eyes, and we try to explain it away rather than recognizing and praising God. The Holy Spirit descended on, on the disciples, and they were speaking in a multitude of tongues. A crowd had gathered to witness the power of God at work in the apostles' lives, and people heard the word of God in their own language. Verse 12, amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? When you see the Holy Spirit active and alive in the believers today, are you amazed and perplexed? Do you ask, what does this mean? Or do you respond like the people in verse 13? Some, however, made fun of them and said they'd had too much wine. You see, Jesus is God, and the Holy Spirit is active and alive within every believer today. And you have a choice. Are you going to respond in amazement and ask, what does this mean when you see the Holy Spirit at work? Or are you going to scoff and dismiss the work of the Holy Spirit so you continue on in your life of sin and rebellion and comfort? Because the life of the believer is challenging. It is hard to dedicate your life to the work of Jesus. It's a major commitment. It's a lifelong and life-changing commitment. Are you committed to the work of Jesus? Are you willing to serve Jesus with your entire life? Are you willing to make sacrifices for the kingdom of God? Are you willing to take risks for Jesus? There is a cost to becoming a disciple of Jesus. I know you've heard me and many other people say it before, that salvation is free, but it will cost your life. But that's not just a catchy slogan, it's reality. Committing to Jesus means giving up certain things that you enjoy. It means doing everything you do to the glory of God. It means repenting and committing to strive on towards perfection when you sin. It means loving your spouse even when they hurt you. It means sacrificing your time and your talents and your resources to Jesus and his church. If you don't feel it financially when you give to the church, you're not really giving. If you don't have to change your friends and the things you like to watch and the jokes you like to tell and the substances you like to consume, then you're not really committed to Jesus. I'll give you an example from, from my life. If you look at me, you can see it's obvious. I like to eat. I like food. And I'm convicted of that as a result. And so I, I commit to fasting once a week, and, and it sucks every time. It's hard. I, I don't enjoy it at all. But there's a cost to being a disciple of Jesus. I know I couldn't do it on my own. But I know I can do all things through the power of the Holy Spirit. So what is the Holy Spirit challenging you to do? How is the Holy Spirit calling you to share the joy of the Lord with your community? How is the Holy Spirit working in your life to serve Jesus by serving your neighbors? If you're not actively serving Jesus, you're not listening to the Holy Spirit in your life. You're like the mockers that made fun of them and said they had too much wine. Verse 14.
turn the page and I'll find it. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It is only nine in the morning. No, this is what is spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all believers. Your sons and daughters will, prof will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit. In those days, they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming and great glorious day of the Lord, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I want to point something out here. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Remember, Pentecost is a festival dedicated to celebrating newness. In the exact moment, God has fundamentally altered how he communicates and relates with his people. The Holy Spirit, speaking through Peter in tongues, begins by quoting the prophet Joel. Here at this time of, of all things new, when Jesus is the Son of God, and Jesus is the way to God, because Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit, dwelling in and among the people of God, who have committed their lives to serving Jesus in a new way. How is this new message conveyed? By quoting the Old Testament. See, Jesus came to fulfill the law, not abolish it. Peter quotes from Joel. And he says that the law and the prophets, the Old Testament is all about Jesus. The Bible is all about Jesus. From start to finish. From Genesis to Revelation. The entire Bible is about Jesus. And, and, and Peter, he quotes from Joel. He could have quoted from Psalms. And in fact, a couple of verses later, he does quote from Psalms. He could have quoted from Isaiah, as Jesus quoted from Isaiah when talking about himself. He quoted from Joel. Now, if you've been joining us for the last few weeks for a moment of joy, every night at 8.30 on our Facebook page, you will know that we just finished reading through Joel. We actually, we actually, discover, we actually discussed this passage not too long ago. And if you've been joining us for the last year or so, you would know that this is the second time we've read through Joel. Now this happens to be a, a, just a, a happy accident. I really don't know how we forgot that we had already read through Joel once before, but we did. And that's okay because Joel is a great book. It's an Old Testament prophecy about judgment on God's people, but it's applicable to us today. Because it's all about Jesus. When Joel talks about the day of the Lord, he's talking about Jesus coming. When Revelation talks about the day of the Lord, John is talking about Jesus. Jesus is coming again on the day of the Lord. For some, the day of the Lord will be terrible. It will be terrifying. But for those of us who have experienced the love of God and the grace of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, it will be a day of rejoicing. It will be a day when we get to see Jesus. Under the old law, only those who followed the law and made the right sacrifices were able to serve God. And Peter points out that that was the old way. At Pentecost, something new happens. And now, through Jesus, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, we no longer keep the tradition of festival days. We no longer need to sacrifice animals or wave loaves of some bread all over the place. The world is gone. We now have a relationship with God. You can experience the power and indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. You can serve Jesus with your life. You can be born again, saved, sanctified, set apart, made holy to serve a holy God in his holy kingdom. Are you willing to commit your life to Jesus? Are you willing to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to fill you and guide you and use you for a holy purpose? Are you looking forward to the day of the Lord, a holy day to celebrate? Let's celebrate. 
Let's celebrate Pentecost together this morning. Let's celebrate May 2-4 together. But let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for all that you give us. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you, throughout the entire Bible, we see Jesus. We pray that our friends and neighbors will see Jesus. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that, that comes inside us and lives in us and allows us to serve a holy God. And we pray that your Holy Spirit moves in this community and it convicts people and it tells people that they need to see Jesus. And we pray for opportunities to share that love and joy with this town. We love you and we love our neighbors and, and, and we, we just pray that your Holy Spirit move and that people come to faith and they come to you and they turn their lives around. We pray that we come to you in repentance. We come to you for forgiveness when we sin and we turn our lives around. We pray that we experience your power and we recognize your work in our lives and in the lives of others. This we pray in Lord Jesus Christ's name.